Let's look at the continuity of the inverse. This is another important property of the calculus of inverse functions, just like the property of the inverse function theorem. So suppose f is one to one and continuous on the open interval i, then f inverse is continuous on the open interval f of i. What's nice about this is that by the intermediate value property, the continuous image of an interval is also an interval. And that's a really, really, again, another very important property using continuity. But another thing that we want to do in order to push this uh, theorem through is we can, without loss of generality, assume that f is increasing. It's one or the other, but if f increases, so does its inverse. Again, that's a very simple property to prove. Uh, the continuity property, though, takes a little bit more arithmetic. So what we're going to do, as we do with any epsilon delta uh, proof, we're going to take an epsilon positive, and we're going to take a y naught in f of i, which will be written as f of x naught. So the idea here is what we want to do is set up some arithmetic that will appeal to the fact that we've assumed that f is increasing. So what we're going to do is write two positive numbers here and take the minimum to be our delta. That is, y naught minus f of x naught minus epsilon is a positive number, and f of x naught plus epsilon minus y naught is a positive number. Now again, you know, we, we take epsilon positive, but it has to make sense for the function. If it's too large and, and you go outside of the domain, then of course that is nothing we have to worry about. So we're tacitly assuming uh, that these make sense relative to our function f. And so now, how do we start the epsilon delta proof? Well, what we want to say is that if y is really close to y naught, then f inverse of y is very close to f inverse of y naught. Basically, we want to show this. When we're learning calculus for the first few weeks, we have this very simple definition for continuity at a point, and that's what we're actually going to do. But now, of course, we're tying in all the uh, attributes of the limiting process to get to that box. So now, if we have this, that is, the absolute value of y minus y naught is less than delta, by our definition here, we can take the negative of this number and place it here to get a number that is less than zero, and we can take this particular positive number and place it here. By this definition of delta and this uh, absolute value inequality, we know that this is true, and it turns out to be a very useful inequality. So what you can see now is that all the y sub zeros absorb, they're gone, and then we're left with f of x naught minus epsilon less than y less than f of x naught plus epsilon. So what we want to do now is apply the inverse function, which we know to be increasing, so it will preserve this inequality. So we apply f inverse to f of x naught minus epsilon, we apply f inverse to y, and we apply f inverse to f of x naught plus epsilon. And of course, these absorb their inverse functions to leave us with x naught minus epsilon. In the middle, of course, we have f inverse of y, and then of course, these absorb to give us x naught plus epsilon. So now what we want to do is just subtract x naught from each of these uh, three terms. But by our definition here, we see that x naught is simply f inverse of y naught. So when we transpose, we get negative epsilon less than f inverse of y minus f inverse of y naught less than epsilon. So basically what we're saying, if we can get y close to y naught, we can actually get f inverse of y close to f inverse of y naught. That is the limit of f inverse of y as y approaches y naught is indeed f inverse of y naught. And we are done.